Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, or almost afternoon in some cases. We're just going to give everybody a few seconds to join the room, and then we'll begin. Great. Just a few more seconds here and then we will begin. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us today for another Opus Connect webinar series. We have a great discussion and panel lined up for you today. So Looking forward to getting to that. Uh, before we begin though, I have a few housekeeping things that I wanna get through. My name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations with Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market uh, M&A focused organization. We cater to private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders, independent sponsors. Um, <clears throat> we are membership based. We have chapters in LA, Chicago and New York, where we hold uh, monthly finance seminars. Um, in addition to those, we do deal sourcing events all around the country. I think we're in 15 or so different markets. Uh, we did cross-border Canada last year. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about Opus Connect and how we can support your business development needs, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, Jacob Zephrin. Um, if we could shift to the next slide here, his contact information is down below. So feel free to reach out to Jacob and he'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, a few things, let's shift to the next slide. You can see below, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists and our moderator, they'll be taking live Q&A, I believe today. Um, so feel free as questions come to mind to pose those in that box below. And again, our moderator will sift through those and answer, <clears throat> excuse me, as many as, uh, as many as we can today. We will, if we have time, uh, designate some time at the end for that as well. So definitely submit your questions and we'll try to get to those. Um, these events would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So I definitely wanna give uh, each of them just a few moments to introduce themselves and their firm. Let's see if we have anyone from Alliant on the call. If we do, please raise your hand, raise your hand. There's a a button at the bottom of your screen similar to the Q&A where you can do that. I'm going to see if anybody pops up here as I search, but if not, we'll move right along. Um, Alliant Insurance, they are a sponsor of our Chicago chapter and additionally are sponsoring today's event. So if you want to learn more about them, feel free to reach out to Fran. Her information is down below. Um, let's move on to the next KLR, is anyone in the room from KLR? I believe it's John. There we are, awesome. John, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and uh, please introduce yourself. Excellent, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is John Soret. I'm a partner at KLR. We are a large regional public accounting firm based in New England uh, for our offices between Rhode Island and Massachusetts. I head up our private equity venture capital services group there, uh, working with middle market, low middle market firms and funds, uh, both on the fund side, as well as the transaction advisory, quality of earnings, due diligence, uh, and portfolio company compliance side. Obviously a breadth of uh, services you can see on the screen. Happy to chat with anyone. Look forward to seeing you later on. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we're gonna move on to Sapient Investigations. David Kogan, I see you in here. Let me unmute you. Uh, please introduce yourself and your firm. Yes, good morning, Lena. Hi, this is David Kogan. I'm a Managing Director of Sapient Investigations. We're an international corporate intelligence firm based out here on the West Coast. We, uh, we work um, broadly with private equity firms, financial services firms, doing uh, executive background checks, essentially, but also a lot of vetting of um, uh, management teams and M&A deals. We work with a lot of large um, commercial lenders as well. <clears throat> we also have a robust uh, business dispute 
division and we do a lot of litigation um, engagement as well. And it's great to be here as always. And thanks for having us. Hopefully we can catch up later. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll move along now to focus search partner, Steve Finder. I see you in here. Please introduce yourself and your firm. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Steve Finder with uh, Focus Search Partners. I'm based in Southern California. Uh, we've got 30, off, or 30 people around the country in nine offices. We're retained executive search, so we focus at the C, the C level, you know, kind of VP to CEO. We have a second group that does middle level management, and we cover everything from technology to healthcare, health tech, manufacturing, and, and a host of other industries. Um, and I uh, would love to get to know all of you when you have a chance. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're going to move along here to four degrees. Ablord, I hope I said that right. I see you here. Please introduce yourself and your firm. Hey there, you have Ablord A. I'm the CEO of Four Degrees based here in Chicago. Uh, we are a deal flow and relationship intelligence software built for the private markets. Today, we have about 100 customers across kind of the private equity and independent sponsors, investment banking, and M&A sectors. And Hello. what we do How are you? combine automation to eliminate <laughs> entry <laughs> about your team's relationship network with actionable intelligence to help you leverage that for your advantage. So everything from detecting deals done in your relationship network to finding your strongest path into companies you're looking to invest into uh, to detecting travel, at least in a post COVID-19 world and sending you a list of relationships that live in the destination city that you're traveling to. So more than happy to connect after the conversation and uh, excited to be joining y'all. Thank you very much. Um, and then lastly, we have Resourcive. Nick, I see you here. Please introduce yourself and your firm. Good to be here. Nick Cressy, Managing Director at Resourcive. We're a firm specializing in IT, telecommunications, spend reduction, and network optimization. Primarily focused, lower middle market, ranging all the way up to that upper middle, uh, working with, with funds around the globe. Really right now, we're focused on immediate cost containment and uh, increasing value in, in the troubled time. So happy to be here and look forward to collaborating down the road. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I don't want to completely ignore, but of course, Voris is our uh, sponsor and host today. And, and Jeff Fickus from there is going to be moderating. So when we introduce him, I'll allow him to introduce the firm as well. But uh, if we weren't sheltering in place or, or staying at home, we'd be in their law offices today. So I definitely want to acknowledge them. Thank you, Jeff. Um, before we begin the discussion, we have a few audience poll questions that we'd like to get to. These are uh, great ways for us to understand who's in the audience and how you heard about us. So bear with us and, and please participate. Uh, we're going to launch the first one here and we'll move through fairly quickly. We want to know how you heard about today's event. We'll give everyone just a few seconds here and then we'll move forward. Thank you for your participation. This is helpful for us. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you. We will go to the next one here, which is, who are you? What, uh, what is your attendee type? Are you an independent sponsor, investment banker, capital provider on the debt or equity side, a service provider? Uh, this is a good way for not only Opus Connect to understand who, who we have in the room, but also for our speakers to understand who they're addressing today. Give everyone about five more seconds or so here and then We'll get to the good part. Great. Awesome. A lot of bankers, some independent sponsors. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you very much for participating. So as we move along here, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to today's moderator. Again, Jeff Fickus Devores. Uh, take it away, sir. Thank you very much, Lena. My name is Jeffrey Fickus. I'm a partner at the law firm of Ori Sater, um, headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, with seven offices around the United States and over 400 professionals. 
Uh, we were founded in 1909. Uh, we are ranked as one of the top 42 firms across the country based on BTI Consulting Group survey of Fortune 500 companies as a uh, go-to full-service A-team law firm. Um, that expertise allows us to bring that level of expertise and at a value proposition based in Midwest cultural values uh, to the middle market, including private equity. We have a longstanding private equity practice, both on the fund side, uh, private equity funds, MES funds, hedge funds, et cetera, and also portfolio companies uh, in New York City, in the Midwest, and across the country. Um, I grew up in a family business, and uh, but for the but for a, a chance, uh, opportunistic chance, I'd be an investment banker. I have a JD MBA from the Ohio State. Uh, College of Law and Fisher College of Business. You can see in my leadership roles, I'm active uh, at the board and senior executive level of the Association of Corporate Growth, uh, the American Bar Association M&A uh, Committee, and a contributing member of content that's used throughout the M&A Bar in the United States, and also uh, alumni board member uh, at the Fisher College of Business. I'm going to introduce. Uh, I'm going to have the other uh, panelists who are wonderful introduce themselves. We're going to start with Jenny Watson. Jenny. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jenny Watson. I'm a vice president of Stream Brothers. We help your m and arm of Eden Capital Markets. I Jenny, we're having you. trouble hearing you. Okay, here, can you hear me better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm a vice president with Kane Brothers, which is the healthcare m and arm of Eden Capital Markets. I'm based in Cleveland, um, but Kane Brothers has offices in, their main offices are in New York and San Francisco. We advise middle market companies across healthcare sectors, including healthcare services, providers, payers, HCIT, um, devices, diagnostics. We have a very strong hospital practice as well. So um, we're squarely involved in a lot of sectors that have been impacted by this crisis. Thanks, thanks everyone, happy to be here today. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Joe Higginbotham. Uh, Joe, you, your mute is on. There you go. Yep. Is that better? Um, so yeah, I'm Joe Higginbotham. I'm a vice president with Convest Partners. Uh, been at Convest for three years on our direct lending team. Prior to that, I was at NXC Capital for five years. Uh, but Convest is a private investment firm. We're headquartered out of West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, we currently have about $4 billion of assets under management, uh, $2 billion of which is on the debt side. Um, we're currently in our in the process of raising our, our fifth fund, which is 1.2 billion on the cover uh, with a $2 billion hard cap. We are about halfway to that hard cap um, and have had a lot of success throughout the month of April fundraising um, and are really actively looking to deploy capital uh, in this market right now. Uh, I'd say 80% of what we do is, is Unitron lending. So, you know, first dollar of senior through the last dollar of where the meds would top out. Uh, with the remaining being kind of split lean or second lean opportunities. Um, we tend to focus on more complex situations or, or segments of the market that are underbanked. Um, we do a lot of healthcare, uh, a lot of specialty finance, um, technology, and, and business services are kind of our, our bread and butter industries. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Kevin Groff. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Kevin Groff. I'm a senior vice president and managing director for U.S. Bank's uh, business owner advisory group. Uh, in our role in the bank, uh, we're really advising our high net worth, ultra high net worth clients uh, who've got needs uh, really with respect to growth and liquidity. Uh, think of us as, as sort of pre-investment banking or specialists that collaborate with, you know, PE funds, direct lenders directly. We collaborate a lot across the country. Uh, with our investment banking partners and as the largest uh, in the country without an embedded investment bank. Uh, we're also a resource up through our corporate, uh, large corporate uh, specialty lending groups, asset-based groups, and really connecting them uh, from sort of banking into sort of non-bank uh, lending and, and specialty situations as the needs arrive. And I expect that in the days to come and the weeks to come, uh, we'll be an increasing resource for those banking customers that we'll need to find um, you know, more creative bespoke solutions to, to the challenges that we're seeing uh, over the last uh, few months. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is Lamar Stanley. Hello, everyone. Uh, Lamar Stanley here. I'm vice president with GenCap America here in Nashville, Tennessee, where unfortunately we are currently without power in East Nashville. Uh, I've been hunting 
Wi-Fi all morning, but uh, the show goes on. And um, what GenCap is doing today is the same thing we've been doing for a little over 30 years, which is uh, being transition capital for companies with two to 10 million of EBITDA. Uh, so lower middle markets, our focus of industries are typically manufacturing, distribution, or basic service companies. And most of our deals take on the look of a management buyout where we back an internal management team to cash out the primary owner uh, who can either stay with the company or, uh, or continue or go ahead and retire. But the, the important part for us is that we're always backing an internal team and, and sticking with that team for the duration of our investment. Thank you, Lamar. Uh, could we flip the page, please? So um, I believe all the attendees are receive, um, can see this now. So today's panel discussion is the new normal, what's changed and what has remained the same, if anything, in M&A. Uh, and as you know, the pandemic has dramatically altered the overall economy and M&A in the past few weeks. Uh, and lower middle market companies are particularly vulnerable, vulnerable uh, depending upon a, a number of, of factors. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market, and this expert panel is going, going to discuss what they're seeing in the market today, what has changed, and what's remained relatively consistent, and we'll be sharing, or they will be sharing, uh, stories, insights, and predictions. And as you can see, we have people from all sides of of the deal table, investment bankers, private equity direct lenders, and I'm a M&A &A lawyer. So with that, um, we're gonna start with basically um, a significant question that's probably gonna take up a significant part of our time today, and it is, so in your world, what has changed and what has remained the same in M&A? And we're gonna start um, with uh, Jenny and Kevin leading us through that discussion. Jenny? Sure, happy to take that. Uh, so um, let me start with what hasn't changed in M&A. Um, and it's, you know, what we've been seeing is that there's still a lot of capital in the market to be deployed. When we think about appetite to pursue M&A, that has not changed. Um, but obviously you haven't been seeing a lot of deals go on and that's driven by what has changed. The two kind of biggest things are, you know, one is valuations. Um, and two is availability of financing. So the first thing on valuations, there's been a huge pullback in the public market, as we know. I mean, um, I guess like at the end of March, um, things have changed since then. You know, it's day by day, as you know. Um, but any changes in the public market will affect into valuations in the private market. That's one. Second thing is earnings, stay at home orders and the ban of elective procedures for, um, for a hospital or. Um, or provider clients, uh, those impacted the valuation. So buyers and sellers are having a hard time meeting in the middle as to what um, ideal valuation should be. Um, and then secondly, on the financing, I mean, some of my other panelists can address that a little bit better, but financing market right after this whole pandemic. Um, Hi, Jen Jenny, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Yeah, so here you go. Um, you know, the financing market's dried up. So, or it has, it was dried up and we've kind of seen percolation of activity in the last week, which is positive. Um, but, you know, really the two big things are valuations and financing. Wonderful. How about you, Kevin? Well, I think what's changed and, and I think all of us are experiencing this is the, really the definition of, of risk particularly systemic risk. And we had a client um, Q4 last year that had a uh, enormously successful business importing from China and selling to what are effectively now mass gatherings. And as we did the underwriting on his opportunity set, it was, hey, what is the risk, right? We pass it through institutional investors, what's the risk? You know, today that business is, you know, probably not gonna resuscitate, right? So when you think about, you know, testing and stress testing and thinking about supply chain and health and safety, I think the, the definitions of risk and therefore the underwriting and the reps and warranties and some of the deal structures, which I know we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, are gonna start to change. Um, but what hasn't changed and, and what we're actually pr projecting to accelerate is, you know, the enormity of opportunities that are going to come through the middle market, you know, just based on, on demographics and need 
for bespoke capital solutions. So for those deals that are, you know, let's call them three to 10 million, you know, those families need liquidity, those families need to provide, those families need to think for the future. And I think as, as all of us as sort of intermediaries and those of us on the, on the panel and on the call that are in the position to provide capital uh, as those creative structures can be put in place, you know, I would anticipate, you know, when the new normal comes around, the deal flow is gonna continue. It's just gonna look uh, a little bit differently, at least for the near term, because of what Jenny said, you know, credit markets and, you know, some of those T's and C's and, and other underwriting concerns that, you know, lenders and investors are gonna have. But overall, cautiously optimistic, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, obviously at the moment. Joe, do you mind adding your perspective of what you're seeing has changed and what has not? Yeah, I would say, you know, we were cautiously optimistic as well about the future, but, you know, right now there just really isn't much of a market um, for, for debt. And, you know, I'd say if you look at volumes year over year, they're down, you know, at least 80% for us, if, if not more. And, you know, um, there are some things getting done. I think we've seen a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel as far as deal flow. Um, you know, for, for March and the first half of April, you know, we weren't really getting any any new books in, and there was probably you know an opportunity list of you know eight to ten things in the pipeline. I'd say in the last you know two weeks or so, we've started to get you know some additional books in uh, that aren't you know just distressed opportunities. You know, looking for um, liquidity. Um, We've been seeing, you know, a handful of things in the technology and, and recurring revenue spaces that, you know, have not necessarily been impacted as much by the virus. But, but you know, from our point of view, where we're sitting today, we have capital to deploy, and it's it's a lot harder to deploy capital now uh, than it was before. And I think, you know, there's certainly less capital out there, but you know, there's far less deals. Um, than there were before. So it's just, um, it's, creating, it's creating some difficulties, but we are, um, we're optimistic that this is gonna create an opportunity going forward, um, you know, and we don't really know when that opportunity is gonna come, but we're hoping in the next six to 12 months, it just depends on when, you know, people start getting back to work and when the economy um, gets back on track. Thank you, Joe. Lamar, how about from your firm's perspective? We're seeing a lot of the same themes that other folks have already mentioned. We are, deal flow has come down precipitously. We, I just did the math actually last week and it, we saw about a 70% drop from where we were about this time last year. So um, we've already seen it. Um, and just speaking, you know, in our little bubble here in, in Nashville where the state of Tennessee is rolling out, we were optimistic that things were going to start opening up and maybe we were pulling out of this, but I just got off the call this morning with the, um, the Nashville update, if you will, and the mayor says our numbers are, are trending in the wrong direction. So while we were pretty optimistic that things were gonna get back to maybe a new normal, but closer to normal, um, sooner than later, we just don't have an expectation. So I think that for now, we are just going to have to find creative ways to get this capital out because we are one of those that men, Jenny mentioned is we've got a lot of dry powder that we have to deploy. So it's just going to be fewer deals to pick from. Thank you. That's going to move us into another question. I'm, I'm reserving some subtopics in this, what has changed for a later discussion point, but let's move to number two. Uh, question number two, what is the current availability of debt? and how have terms changed? And I'll ask you to talk about direct lending versus bank lending and what private equity sponsors are doing uh, to fill the gap uh, themselves. Um, I'll ask uh, Joe and Jenny to lead that conversation. Yeah, I can, I can kind of kick that one off. Um, you know, as, as people have mentioned already and, and I alluded to, there's still quite a bit of capital out there, but you know, from what we've heard talking to our competitors, um, you know, a lot of people are dealing with their portfolio issues and, you know, liquidity, you know, particularly funds that use leverage or warehouse lines that as a result of this have been asked to, um, you know, by the banks that are providing those lines to, to fund additional equity uh, in their portfolio. So it is 
creating in some situations a um, you know strain on liquidity across the market. Um, but there's just such little deal volume out there right now that it's not necessarily not necessarily showing. Um, you know, and you have the commercial banks kind of focusing on, you know, revolver draws, the PPP loans and other liquidity needs. And then, um, you know, guys like us uh, and our competitors who, you know, are, are addressing our existing issues in our portfolio. Um, so as far as what we're seeing in the market, you know, for the deals that we are issuing term sheets on and, you know, from what we've gathered from investment bankers, you know, the, the market is kind of two to 400 basis points wide of where it was uh, going into this. But, you know, it, it seems to kind of change on a weekly basis. And, you know, for the stuff that we have seen that hasn't been impacted by, you know, coronavirus at all, I'd say it's more of a 200 basis point spread for the stuff that's been a little bit more impacted. Um, but, you know, still a viable business um, that, you know, is expected to have, you know, liquidity concerns in, in the near term, it's probably closer to three or 400. But, um, you know, structuring leverage is certainly less than, than what it was. We were looking at a recurring revenue uh, software business, um, you know, last week and, you know, trying to get, you know, some reads from bankers about where the market is so we can, you know, issue as competitive a term sheet as possible. And they said for the, you know, more aggressive institutions that used to lend two to three times recurring revenue, that's kind of come down to more, you know, one and a half to two times. And then for cash flow loans, you know, it's probably at least a turn of leverage below that. And so, um, you know, sponsors are often having to fund, uh, you know, the difference with additional equity. Yeah, so, and thank I'll, you. Uh, I'll add on to that we're seeing pretty much the same thing right after um, the lockdown period, which I guess started in mid-March. Mid um, we weren't seeing anything done in the bank market for the leverage loans. Jenny, leverage where, loan where, side. Where, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, we weren't seeing anything get done kind of um, end of March and beginning of April. Slowly, we have started seeing deals come through. Um, there have been lenders that have been funding, but like Joe mentioned, the spreads are, are especially wide um, and pretty expensive. So a lot of sponsors have resorted to um, kind of doing pipe investments or uh, minority investments or even substituting some of that with equity. Um, one thing to note though, it, it, it's ex the, the lending um, that's been occurring the last couple of weeks, it's both expensive and the terms aren't necessarily very favorable. So you're, get, you're seeing a lot of um, non-call debt that, uh, for probably the next two years. Um, so we're seeing some sponsors kind of looking at equity and seeing what they can do with, the, with um, uh, investing in equity instead. Interesting. Yeah. We're also expecting a big, a big comeback in, in the mass markets, which have been softer over the last two to three years. But, um, you know, with, with clearly a larger delta to fill between, you know, the senior debt and the equity, um, we expect a lot of mass lenders to be um, really taking back some market share. And, and based on the discussions we've had with those lenders, they've been, they've been very busy. Uh, we actually have a question, and uh, I wanted to ask you, the lenders particularly, or people that are seeing lenders, are lenders not seeing opportunities, or are they reluctant to lend into distressed situations? I guess I'll toss that to the group. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, I, I really think it's a lack of opportunity, and, and again, um, you know, if you just look at the number of books we've gotten in over the last uh, six weeks, it's, it's down 70 to 80% year over year. And then, you know, the stuff that we are seeing is either really, really clean and has not been that impacted by coronavirus, or it's, it's purely distressed stuff and businesses that were probably having issues going into the pandemic and, you know, because of the liquidity constraints that they face, you know, as a result of that, things have just come to a head. And so um, we're seeing those types of opportunities, but the, the middle of the road opportunities for, you know, um, businesses that, you know, may have been a little more challenging, but still good death stories are, we're not really seeing those right now. 
That's interesting. Um, I've been reading a lot about um, bank lenders. Um, I would have thought that there might have been some transitioning of what had historically may, maybe been a syndicated loan uh, where they were trouble having trouble finding syndicate partners transitioning to you, but you're not necessarily seeing that. Yeah, I mean, we're actively looking for that. Um, you know, okay. historically, our, our platform is such we don't participate in a lot of the broadly syndicated loans. Um, you know, we're more either the sole lender or a, a small club with two to three other lenders at most. Um, but we've been out there looking for opportunities in the syndicated market, and it just seems like most stuff is not trading right now. Uh, lenders have their heads down. They're working on, you know, working out issues in their own portfolio. And, um, you know, there could be issues down the road that, that force them to transact, but, um, you know, we haven't hit that yet. And I think we're under the view that the market is probably not hit the bottom yet, either in the, the public or private um, debt or equities markets. And so, um, you know, a lot of the people I talk to, they're expecting the real pain to come kind of around 630, you know, when, um, you know, second quarter earnings are, are getting geared up to come out and when, you know, uh, people are, you know, reporting covenants. The opportunities that uh, the debt providers are seeing, what's changed with their credit analysis, their um, commitments? Are, are they tightening up on uh, things like uh, MAEs or MACs, um, deadline dates, uh, pro forma financial covenants, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I guess I can take that one. Um, you know, I would say there's probably been a limited data set uh, for, for those types of points. Um, at this stage, nothing has gotten past term sheet. And we have a few things in the pipeline that you know, we're hoping to get signed up sooner than later, but nothing's really gone to documentation. So the types of MAEs and, and stuff you're referring to, uh, we just haven't really gotten to that. Um, our normal diligence process has, already been, has always been pretty thorough. Um, so I also don't think anything out of the ordinary will come from this, from our normal diligence process. Uh, th the one thing that may change going forward is just you know, a broader focus on diversification. Um, obviously, you can't underwrite every loan to withstand a pandemic like this, because these types of events typically happen once every 100 years. But there will probably be more focus on diversification going forward. Well, let's move on to the next question um, to be led by Kevin and Lamar. Why are some deals getting closed that were in process when this hit a few weeks ago and others are not? Are there any consistencies as to why some are closing and some are not, what people are doing to be able to allow deals to close versus those that are not? Um, you know, anecdotally, there's, there's really, it's, it's the tale of the haves and have nots where we've seen some activity. And I know there's a couple of banks here in the program today uh, who've had, you know, smaller add-on deals closing uh, that were not repriced. They were probably, you know, reasonably priced in the first place. Uh, we're seeing, uh, deal flow within our client group of, you know, smaller businesses going to strategics who may be just tapping their revolver, don't need to go outside for capital. Uh, it was a, a, a long coveted asset in a, you know, long-term hold industry. So, so some of those situations where the risk dynamics really haven't shifted um, or the, the demand will snap back more predictably, I think we're, we're still seeing the desire to get those deals done. Uh, I would say that anything on the larger end or anything on the sponsor side, you know, we're seeing a, you know, you know, really there's two buckets. Everything has either stopped or it's proceeding uh, with activity that may or may not be productive, right? It's, it's moving it forward, but not pulling the trigger and just wanting to know if the knife has, has fallen all the way in those industries. So I'm not sure uh, if those are closing or not, but, but obviously there's some activity and part of it is just all of us wanting to stay busy. Uh, but, but we are seeing some closings on the, on the lower end of the scale, uh, probably just because price and risk are aligned. Thanks, Kevin. How about you, Lamar? Yeah, I'm not going to say much to add other than our portfolio is a, is a really good example of that dynamic that Kevin's describing. We have three or four companies that are could best be described as thriving during this period. And it's just because they are in those specific islands that are benefiting from this 
situation. One's an e-retailer, so everyone's sitting at home and ordering their products. And um, another is a grocery store chain. So, um, you know, that has just been gangbusters. So, um, and the other are healthcare related, so it's a little bit more obvious. But the, the, the point being is we're seeing process. We actually submitted a letter last week on one of those types of companies where we don't expect much impact both to this point and then going forward. Um, for the processes, like Kevin described, though, that are going on that are impacted, we are continuing to work on things very slowly, um, partially because of just the dynamic of a p pandemic. We can't visit, we can't do a lot of the things that are required to get to a close, but also because I think generally all people involved, lenders, sellers, us, um, we're in a wait and see. I, I think we're at a point where the crystal ball is is most foggy in terms of where the market is headed um, out of this, because it's been very clear to this point what the impact should be, but looking out two, three months, what the state of M&A will be, unfortunately, is, is it's grown a little dark. Does anyone else want to add anything to those uh, comments from Kevin and Lamar? Okay. So from from a, I'll add from a healthcare perspective, um, you know, agree with Lamar. It's very very sector related. There are some sectors that have not been impacted or benefited by this, like HIT, diagnostics, um, healthcare distribution. We're seeing um, benefit from this, and then anything related to the consumer or anything related to the provider, things like dentists, dermatologists, um, and then to a lesser extent, medical devices those have been um, impacted negatively as well. And so those have, some of those have um, retraded and, and just haven't gotten done. At this time, I'd like to ask for the next poll question, which is how long will the recession last? Uh, Maricel or Lena, do you mind posting that? Yeah, we'll get that uh, on screen shortly here. Let's give it maybe five more seconds and then we'll hang on the results for a second so you guys can see okay. uh, what, what everyone responded. Wow. Lena, can the entire audience see these results? I believe everyone should be able to see them, um, but I'll read them off. It looks like 11% believe that it will last for three to six months, 39% believe it will last six to 12 months, 44%, which is the majority here, believes it will last 12 to 24 months, and 6% believe it will last over 24 months. For those of you who uh, are involved with companies that have received PPP and were blindsided last week with the new guidance that came out uh, caused by political pressure that uh, you now had to prove that you didn't have other sources of liquidity uh, to be able to certify in good faith that uh, you uh, needed the plant, needed the PPP or it was necessary. Um, that's an interesting that's an interesting response because people are thinking in terms of this is not going to turn around in in three to six more than likely not going to turn around in in three to six months and that creates the anxiety and the uh, and the uncertainty i want to take a step back and ask a little bit about um what going forward you're either seeing now a new deal flow coming in uh, or what you expect to happen for uh, buyers and sellers to bridge the gap. This goes to what has changed and what might change in the future. What, what they're going to do to bridge the gap in valuation based on pandemic risk now and pandemic risk that might last upwards for 24 months until there's a, a vaccine that, that 
the population and the market can feel confident in. Um, Kevin, do you mind talking in terms of what you're seeing? Um, well, look, I mean, prices are sticky going down, but there's also the reality of, of you know, shifts. So we are counseling our clients with business interests that, you know, you've, you've got to look through a different lens. You know, obviously those businesses that are thriving can afford to wait. Those businesses where you've got ownership uh, that's sort of in the tail end of that transition period, you know, there, there are needs for solutions. So I think there's, uh, in what we've seen thus far is there's more uh, participation and upside. There's more creative ways that are coming back to bridge the gap. You know, part of that's liquidity driven and, and part of it is expectation driven. But, you know, I would, I would advise clients that, uh, look, if, if that liquidity needs to be sooner than later, you, you've got to be more realistic about those structures of risk sharing, which is ultimately what drives the, the deal structure, right? So, so if you can define it, maybe we can defend it. But if it's uncertain, you know, there's got to be, uh, you know, the ways of the past to, to, to bridge some of those gaps. Lamar, what about you in, in your pipeline? We're seeing the same thing, and, and we're probably the best example of what Kevin just described. We have not been a firm historically that's used a lot of earnouts, um, but we, we're realizing that that's probably just going to be the facts of the future. And that's going to be the way that we bridge that gap, as he described it, between what a seller thinks and maybe expectations based on historical valuations and where the company was to where people expect it to come out on the other side. Um, on that note too, we, we have, you know, our weekly calls over zoom and, and the meat of the call for the past three weeks has been a discussion around the COVID ad back and how we're exactly, we're going to get there. You know, in the, in the old days, we just took TTM and used multiple of cash flow, And that's kind of how we came up with valuations. Well, obviously that's not going to, going to do it, um, going forward. If you're in an industry that was severely impacted by this. So. Uh, what we anticipate is a lot of diligence around cash flow, and there's not going to be a formula that we can use for that ad back just because, you know, an airline, if you're buying an airline, things have changed and they're going to look this way for a very long time per Warren Buffett. Or if you're looking at a dentist office, that's just delayed revenue. So you can expect a little bit bigger pop coming back. So every industry is going to have different dynamics that we're going to have to look at in terms of coming up to with the valuation and trying to pitch that to the, to the seller on where exactly we think the value of the company is. Thank you. Is anyone seeing um, buyer stock being used more often in the risk sharing slash upside category? Uh, the earnouts that you're thinking about, are they more geared in terms of straight percentages or are they kind of milestone based? We, so we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, since okay. we're new to this, we're probably the wrong ones to ask. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the folks think. But um, in our opinion, simpler is going to be better. Um, so first, what we're basing it on, probably more often revenue, although we haven't come to that conclusion necessarily. And then two, you know, we would like to have it, while we do want to err on the side of simplicity, we would like to give the seller plenty of opportunity to gather back as much value as possible along the way. So that's a long way of saying we haven't figured it out yet. Does anyone else have any experience with the bridging of the gap in valuation through earn out or any other economic strategy? Well, we actually have a question that is right on point about, you know, who's getting hurt the most. Uh, what industries do you expect to bounce back and which ones will be slower to recover? Jenny, what do you think? Um, well, and I also see another question I can um, answer that as well, which is, uh, let me pull it up, it says, what is your best guess on when bank attacks is usually? We're having trouble hear, hearing you, but uh, the first one is which industries do you think will bounce back relatively quickly and which ones will be slower to recover? Yeah, so um, so from my perspective, and I'm going to answer this other question too, which is when's your best guess and when dental practices will be operating at over 25%? Can you hear me better now? Does this yes. work? Okay. Um, 
so their dental practice is a good one because it's a lot, you know, there's commercially funded dental practices and then there's government, you know, where a majority of the revenues come from um, government payers, those will bounce back um, pretty quickly. Um, you may see some delays of people going back to the dentist, but in terms of um, that kind of payer mix, that I think those, that those kind of dental practices will be benefited by this. The ones that are more commercial in nature, right? You're, you're, it's going to be impacted negatively because of the high rate of unemployment, um, fewer people having insurance. And so, you know, in terms of that sector, you're going to see a divergence. But in general, I mean, from, from our perspective in healthcare, look, there are things like surgeries, um, which were considered elective. There's cardiac surgeries and orthopedic surgeries that have been considered elective. Um, those will bounce back when things open up. Um, but then there are some where it's just, you know, preferences like um, going to visiting your doctor. Um, that will take a really long time to bounce back if that ever will, because a lot of that has gone into tele uh, um, telemedicine. So I'm not sure if you could hear me there, but, you know, it it's going to change with every sector. Does anyone else have any opinions about sector industry related recovery? Well, I would just add that even within sectors, you're going to see a huge disparity. Um, I do some consulting in the travel and tourism, owing from my history at, at Wyndham Worldwide, and, and you're going to see, um, or what we forecast to see, are the, the larger drive to family vacation destinations. You know, they're going to do reasonably well. The forward bookings for late June, July, you know, look reasonably robust, you know, 80% of, of pre-COVID um, fly to destinations, mountain ski destinations, as an example. Um, it, it's going to be challenged because A, you're going to lose lift uh, on the air capacity and, and B, um, that wealthier demographic uh, isn't necessarily going to want to be, you know, squeezing in that too, you know, near term. So when you think about those businesses that have exposure, you know, across the realm, they're going to behave a lot differently and it's going to have a real impact on, you know, the, the survivability of, of some of those entities. Switching gears on you, um, you know, the uh, financial crisis of 2008 brought about some changes in M&A that have carried forward in talking to you and the you wonderful panelists before uh, this conference, we talked about some things that are changing and th that are important to underwriting and, and assessing uh, an acquisition target, one being supply chain and more than just concentration of supplier customers. What are the, some of the things that you expect to happen um, and which of those will be permanent as it, as it pertains to what you're gonna see in Sims coming, books coming through uh, in, in selling a company and what type of diligence, uh, additional diligence is gonna occur going forward to, uh, to assess that risk. Well, I think a lot of the, um, particularly on the strategic side, a lot of the, the, the risk diligence was, um, you know, it was light, right? It was, is really overlooked. You're, you're thinking about the enterprise, the larger enterprise having a more robust um, compliance strategy going forward. Um, but what we see happening, this just happened just pre COVID where the rep and warranty issuers were starting to um, increase the exclusions. Um, I think when you think about that, as it pertains to the liquidity of a deal. I think it suggests that post COVID, those reps and warranties and indemnifications are gonna go back to the old standards a little bit, at least for a while. We think about employee health and safety and some of those issues that historically haven't created a lot of anxiety with sellers. Um, it's gonna be about who's gonna hold that risk and how do you identify it and quantify it. And you know, supply chain's probably part of that. And you think about a, you know, the public entities also with Sarbanes-Oxley and the need to disclose supply chain risk, I think that all kind of reverberates through, you know, down into our middle market also. Those, those are great points. We're, we're, we're seeing the same thing around rep and warranty insurance, good old fashioned indemnification and uh, escrow clauses to cover the gaps. Um, some of it's not yet known. So anyone else have any comments on that?
Is anyone seeing anything in negotiations, even at the LOI stage, uh, relating to wanting to, sellers always want to have more detailed uh, letters of intent because they're giving or granting exclusivity. Um, what are you seeing at that stage of beginning of negotiations at LOI, both in terms of uh, the, what the buyer is asking for as far as amount of exclusivity period or what do you think is going to happen with that from what's relatively short right now? And then what do you think sellers are going to want or what are you reading or seeing that sellers are going to want some certainty about as it relates to uh, certainty that the deal will close under the terms negotiated in the LOI? Lamar, are you seeing anything there? We are, yep. Um, the, so historically, because all of our deals take on a management buyout type look where we back an internal management team, call it the GM or plant manager to, to buy out the owner, most of our diligence has been around taking care of the team. They like to call a lot of our past partners to make sure that we, we act the way we say we're going to act and that type of thing. Well, the turn in the past three weeks, the focus of a lot of that diligence has been surety of close. Um, shorter exclusivity periods, or at least uh, we've, we've heard discussions of, you know, this is the exclusivity period with the option to extend it to this based on these milestones. Um, so that everyone realizes, you know, the importance of that. And then the other part to that is we've had to lead with the point that we have a fund behind us. We are going to bridge this in the event that lending got difficult and then we could finance it later. Um, and that seemed to be something that was very important to a lot of the, the sellers who we've talked to to this point. Interesting. Anybody else? Yeah, I would say we've seen some of the same, um, you know, sellers forcing uh, capital providers and buyers to move very quickly through their diligence in order to get the transaction closed in a compressed time frame. And we have two instances of that. And that's primarily for deals that have not been impacted by COVID-19 that are, you know, pretty high quality assets in this environment. And um, the sellers just have a lot of concern about um, the buyer's ability to execute in this environment. So they want to they want to move things along as quickly as possible. That's interesting because you would think the leverage could would potentially be in favor of the buyer. Uh, but I know sophisticated sellers are asking for things and letters of intent and being being everyone on the legal side is being much more cautious around material adverse changes that would allow the buyer to get out of the deal relating to, you know, pandemic type issues. Um, and also representations and warranties around ordinary course of operating the, uh, the business since the last balance sheet date. And then if it's a sign and, and later close, also those operating covenants um, between signing and closing. Everyone's being much, much more careful because of what's happened here. No one is operating their business in the ordinary course consistent with past practice anymore. So you can't default to that type of language as a seller and think that you're going to be safe. And now you're seeing with larger companies, um, you know, in, in the press, a lot of litigation around uh, buyers trying to extricate themselves out of deals uh, under the, under a Mac argument or a, a breach of an operating uh, pre-closing covenant by the seller to operate the business uh, in a certain manner. So we're seeing a lot of that on, on the legal side. And candidly, I don't have a good sense yet where that's going to shake out as far as um, how much litigation is going to ensue. I know that the courts historically in Delaware have been very hesitant to allow buyers out of deals under um, material adverse change clauses. And my suspicion is that's, that's going to continue unless there's some proof or this ends up to be of you know, of very significant duration of uh, period that there's going to be this type of harm to uh, the target company's business. Can anyone speak to an issue? There's a question that we have around reshoring or investment in infrastructure. Does anyone have any uh, anecdotal evidence or any opinions around you know supply chain issues as it relates to reshoring or reinvesting in infrastructure here in uh, North America? 
I don't know if this necessarily drives home or speaks to that directly, but I will just reiterate your point, Jeff, that a lot of the diligence that we're going to do going forward, we're going to have to spend more time, I should say, around supply chain, whereas previously we were pretty heavily focused on obviously supplier concentration. Um, we're probably going to look at the, the, um, the relationships with those and talking about those with the seller, you know, what's the strength of the relationship and what's the history of being able to get what you need. Yeah. And I wanted to tie, tie up loose ends on the uh, industry question. Um, now, obviously brick and mortar retail has been harmed. Nonprofit healthcare has been substantially harmed because of the stay at home orders and people not doing elective procedures and, and even appointments. Uh, even some in even some manufacturing we're seeing be harmed if um, depending on whether or not they're they they were deemed to be essential um, products or services. So um, that's a lot, you know, good old fashioned Midwest manufacturing and distribution, or even nationwide is is a lot of what I do on a day to day basis. Our firm is much more diversified than that, but. You know, I think the things that people are reading in the national press is pretty consistent with what our assessment is, you know, hospitality, restaurants, uh, brick and mortar retail, uh, going to have a long road to hoe. You saw yesterday that J. Crew filed Chapter 11. Um, I think we're at the done, we're coming to the end of our panel discussion, and there's one more poll question I'd like to uh, finish up with, and that is, do people plan to conduct business virtually uh, once things return to quote unquote normal? I've been talking to a lot of people that that believe that that the real estate, uh, commercial real estate is going to take a hit because companies are now learning that they can actually operate in this manner uh, in some ways more efficiently and that their overhead cost structure can change substantially. So I'm interested in this, in the pool of, uh, of, of the folks that are attendees today. They're not obviously representative of all the industries impacted, but um, you know, a lot of people that are in the M&A world in a lot of different roles working with uh, operating companies on a day-to-day -day basis. So it looks like uh, sixty nine percent believe yes, a material portion of business development will continue to be conducted virtually and thirty two percent no. Well, I want to thank uh, the wonderful panelists who uh, were so generous to volunteer their time today. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank all the attendees for attending today and asking these wonderful questions. We really enjoyed it. Obviously we could go on for two more hours and, and not exhaust all these topics. Uh, Lena, is there anything else that we need to do for the good of the order? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. And, and thank you to all of our panelists, Kevin, Lamar, Joe, and Jenny. We appreciate you guys uh, and your contributions. Thank you, of course, to our sponsors. Uh, for your support, for anybody that is continuing on in the Deal Connect one-on-one -on -one meetings, you will want to log out of here now and log into your second link. You should have received that from my colleague Terrence Winters. Um, if you have any issues with that, reach out to myself or the team. But other than that, we have more webinars coming up, uh, specifically another one tomorrow on managing capital during this time. So look out for information on that. Uh, again, thank you to our panelists and to all of you attendees. We'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.